going to start our new series uh, called Fear Not, uh, and it's kind of a neat series. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're looking at the Christmas story, but we're not kind of doing that cliche kind of look at like how you, every year you look at how Jesus was born and the story and everything that went with it. Tonight we're going to kind of take that story though and dissect it uh, a little bit, and what it is is we're going to look at uh, how sometimes we're afraid of the plans God has for us. Um, God has plans, he plans things, and uh, sometimes when they come into act, it scares us to actually go through with the plans uh, that he has. And so what we're doing is looking at the three different times the angels appeared uh, in the Christmas story. And so uh, one of the things you see when the angels appear is the first thing they always say is, fear not. Um, that's what they say to everybody when they appear, like, hey, don't be scared, fear not, you know. And we're going to kind of look at what the true meaning uh, of that words uh, or that phrase uh, is and why it's so significant when we hear the angels uh, say it to whoever they're talking to. So what we'll do is each week we're going to look at somebody different. Tonight we're going to look at Mary and look at her side of the story. Next week we're going to look at Joseph because I think sometimes people forget about Joseph. Uh, I mean, he was the father to a virgin baby, so you got to understand that he had a lot that he was going through. Uh, the Son of God. Uh, so we're going to look at his part, look at him, and then the other week we're going to kind of look at uh, the others that were involved uh, in that Christmas story. So when we focus on Mary, the thing that I want you to kind of look at with her uh, is think about it. She's a teenage, uh, a teenage girl. Okay, This teenage girl, she's your age. Uh, for those of you that are in here, she's the same age you are, and she's being bestowed to uh, give birth to the Son of God. So it's pretty heavy stuff. You have to think at her age, I'm sure that's the last thing on her mind. Uh, what's going on is that, hey, I'm about to give birth to the Son of God, the Almighty, the Chosen One. Uh, that's what she's about uh, to go through. But what's neat about this story is you guys can really relate it to your own lives. Uh, because Mary, uh, she hadn't had plans to, to do that. She wasn't planning to to give birth to the Son of God. So she had a lot of other things going on. And um, in our lives, I think that we uh, have plans, that we have things that we, have, uh, that we want to do and that were planned out, and that sometimes God intervenes. Uh, but those plans that God has for us, um, they scare us. And uh, a lot of times that we feel like God is, uh, he just has, he's always wanting something. There's always something that when God comes around, we feel like God, God, God wanting something from me. But I think that we look at God like that sometimes. Uh, how many of you have that person in school that when you see them, you turn the other direction because you know the moment they talk to you, they're going to ask you for something. Hey, can I get a ride somewhere? Hey, do you have a little extra money for some like milk money? You know, I forgot I left my lunch money at home. Uh, is that you guys? They all constant. They all run from each other constantly asking. <laughs> oh, see, so we know that person. Or maybe it's uh, maybe it's that phone call. You get a Snapchat. You get an Instagram post. You get a message or a text. You're like, I'm not answering it. Because I know they're not saying, hey, how are you doing? They're saying, hey, so uh, did you do that homework? Can I copy off that? Can I look at? So we all have that person in our lives that the moment we hear from them, we know, hey, they're about to ask me for something. But sometimes I feel like we treat God that same way, that when God comes around or we feel like God's talking to us, that he's just wanting something from us. That God's wanting us to do somewhere or go something or maybe he's saying like, you know, you feel like every, when a God comes around, he, I know he's going to try and ask me to be a missionary. You know, God's going to like send me off somewhere to another country or somewhere where there's no running water and I have to bathe in a, a river and all these like, I know that's what God's asking, uh, but I, I got to kind of distance myself from that because I think as Christians, we all want to be close enough to God at times to experience the good stuff, the blessings that he has, uh, experience heaven. We want to be close enough to those things, but we don't want to be close enough to really like surrender our lives to him. Like, I, I don't want to be that missionary. That's not for me. I know, God, you say I'm, that's in my plans, but that's not me. OK, that, I'm, not, I'm not that person. I'm not going off to another country. I'm not doing this. Or maybe you're saying, like, I'm not going to leave this small group. I'm not going to go talk to that kid nobody else talks to, uh, you know, because I, maybe you feel like you're pushing me toward. That's not that's not for me, God. I'm not I'm not going to do that. But I think we get scared at times because if we do surrender, we kind of wonder, OK, what's God got hiding up his sleeve? What's, what's God got planned out uh, if I do this? But there is a real sense of fear with God's plans. And that's okay, because sometimes with God's plans, it's the unknown. We don't know what God has. God's not going to sit there and say, oh, by the way, this is going to happen on this date and this and this, and this is going to go right and this is going to wrong. We don't know. 
We just know that we feel like God gives us the ability to know what we need to do and where we need to go, and that's it. We just have to have that, that faith in him. So I think you also kind of go to yourself a little bit and say, okay, what if I give into God? What if I surrender my life to God and it doesn't go the way that I planned? It doesn't turn out like it is, or I hate what I'm doing. What happens if I give in to that? So that fear of not knowing, that fear of the plan God has, sometimes it can be a power that's overwhelming to us, uh, or sometimes it can really overtake us. So it can keep us from really chasing after uh, what God has for us. Some of you have heard me say this before, uh, but I, I've heard before a lot of times that people say the fear is the absence of faith. So when you give in to fear or you have fear, there's, you don't have any faith in it. What I've kind of looked at that and said is, I don't think fear is the absence of faith. I, I actually think fear is having faith, but it's faith in the wrong things. Like, for instance, if you're, if you're scared to death of heights, are you going to go, uh, you're, you're probably not going to want to go jump out of an airplane and go uh, parachute. And you're like, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Because you have a fear, maybe in your mind you say, that parachute's not going to work. Okay, I'm going to jump out. I'm going to be the one person in like a million people that the cord doesn't come out. The cord's going to break. You know, what if that happens? You've given in to that. What if you've taken that faith and you've put faith in the fear, in the what if. Maybe you're one of those people that's scared of bridges. I've heard of that. I've had written in the car people that they don't even look out the window. They've got to look up like, I don't like bridges. I don't like being on them. What if it gives out? What if it breaks? What if something falls down? That's a fear, and that actually is a faith that you have in that because faith is believing in something. So you believe it's not going to work. So that fear actually is, um, is having, uh, having that faith. For me, a couple of weeks ago, some of you guys got the pure enjoyment of watching me play with a snake, okay? Pastor Brandon sat up here and said, I cried like a girl. Everybody's seen the video. I didn't cry. I was just on the edge of crying. But you never saw, my, ears, my, eye, my, my eyes were sweating. I'm not going to lie to you. They were tearing up a little bit. Uh, but I never actually gave in to it. But what's, what's kind of funny about that is when you look at that fear from that, in my, in my mind, I'm thinking like, yeah, Pastor Jen and Pastor Brandon, they're, gonna, I'm, I'm, they're not saving me from this. Like, I'm getting bitten. Uh, the snake's going to eat me. The snake's going to wrap himself around my arm. I'm going to just die. I'm done here. I'm going to die in the middle of this dingy store uh, on this dirty floor. The snake's going to kill me. But I knew in my heart, honestly, they weren't going to let that happen. They, weren't, they, they knew that the snake wasn't going to hurt me. They made sure it wasn't a poisonous one. Uh, you know, they had put that time uh, and work into it. But I let that fear, even knowing that nothing was going to happen, that I wasn't going to get hurt, that I was just there to face my fear of that snake, knowing that all I got to do is hold it. It's not going to do anything to me. I still gave in. I thought, no, there's no way. They've set me up for failure they set me up a way to commit, uh, you know, to kind of like murder me without anybody knowing. Like, that's the way I kind of felt it was going down. Like, I had a legitimate fear. Why I have a fear of snakes, I don't know. I can't tell you. It just starts sweating. I almost start crying when I have to, especially when I'm around them, especially when they brought out that like 12 footer. Uh, I don't care what anybody says, that thing was about that big around. It was legit. I see what you did there. Your name's that. Okay. I, I've got, I, I see, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So, but that was, that was me. I gave in uh, to that fear, but fear drives us to that point. Fear kind of puts us to that place where we're kind of scared uh, of what's going on. Um, 2 Timothy 1, uh, verse one or chapter 1, verse 7, here's what it says. For God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. So when we read that, uh, in your mind, you might think like, okay, Adam, I'm not going to face, I'm not going to face fear with love. Like that makes no sense. No, that's not true. What if you, what if you have a fear of bullies? What if you have a fear of people who pick on you, but all you do is continue to show love to them. You continue to be respectful. You continue to not uh, feed into it and give back to them. God has given you that ability to fight fear. God knows we're human. We're going to be scared of things, but God's here to tell us in that verse, hey, I've not, I've given you I've not given you the spirit of fear. I've given, you the sp I've given you the spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline so you can deal with that fear. You're not going to let it give in and defeat uh, who you are. So why is it that we're often afraid of God's plans? Why do, we, why do we almost run 
from the plans that God has for us. So we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to look at that from the Christmas story. We're going to look at it from the point of Mary. But that question that I have for you, I actually have two, I actually have two answers to that. Why are we afraid of God's plans? So the first answer I have to that question, so if you want to write down the question one more time, why is it we are often afraid of God's plans? The first answer to that is, God's interruptions are often inconvenient. God's interruptions are often inconvenient. So tonight, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start down in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Real quick, uh, just a side note, if you look at that first uh, verse that we're looking at, um, it's kind of a, just a, there's nothing to do with tonight's story, but it's just kind of cool, fun facts, so you can kind of, you know, wow your friends with this. But if you look at verse 26, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the village in Galilee. So leave that, I'm going to have them leave that up there real quick. When you look at that, you're, okay, great. Who's, who's Elizabeth? Why is there, uh, why are we talking about Elizabeth? I thought we were talking about Mary. There's no virgin Elizabeth, there's the virgin Mary. Elizabeth is actually a relative of Mary, and actually the angel appears. See, Elizabeth had had trouble having kids as well. An angel appears to Elizabeth and says, you will end up being pregnant. You're going to have a baby. Guess who that baby ends up being? John the Baptist. See? You know how we always have talked about how uh, John the Baptist and Jesus are always, like, compared? It's because they're related. See? See what it is there? So that's just something you can wow your friends with. Nothing to do with the story. So let's go ahead. We're going to continue in verse 27. To a virgin named Mary, she was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think, what would this angel could mean? Okay, so real quick, we think think about this angel that shows up. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of the angel showing up, I always think about this fat, bald baby on a cloud that kind of shows up. Like, hey, Mary, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. You know, that's what's in my mind. I always has like this cartoon characters like floating around talking to Mary. But in all actuality, angels are like this fierce warlike creature. Did you know that angels can actually take down an entire nation just by God's command? They are the warriors for God. They're the soldiers of God's army. And that, but what's neat about these like fierce warlike creatures is that they have enough, uh, they're, they have enough patience and submissiveness uh, to really just take care and protect an innocent child. So God sends the angels to talk uh, to Mary and kind of protect over uh, Jesus. Real quick, one more interesting fact, so you can write this down and while you're friends. Did you know that there's only twice in the entire Bible that angels are given names? One of them is here with Gabriel, and then the other one is, uh, you hear is uh, Michael, uh, or the archangel, okay? So that's the two times that we actually hear. Most of the time when you read a verse, you'll say, oh, the angel appeared, the angel did this, the angel did that. You never really see them given names unless it's like this significant time frame. So this is one of those. So Gabriel, or the angel, appears to Mary, tells Mary, hey, you know, this is what happens. Uh, God has favor with you and sees this. So when we do, I want you to kind of imagine Mary again, Kind of put, your, put yourself in, in her life and think. At this point, the angel says, hey, I know you're engaged to Joseph. And in her mind, she's got her plans, what she's thinking of. She's doing what every teenage girl is doing. She's got her Pinterest board. She's got it out. She's got all the different things they're doing on their wedding. Okay? She's like, oh, I'm going to wear this dress, and my wedding's going to look like this. And Joseph's going to be wearing this, and we're going to have this food. She's got all these different boards of nothing but their wedding. That's what's going through her mind. She's thinking, like, I'm going to go to the, this is where we're going after our wedding. You know, we're going to have this kind of donkey at our house. We're going to use this. This is how we're going to get around. This is where we're going to go. This is, she's thinking of all these different things. She is not anywhere near God thinking about what, you know, how she's going to give birth to the Son of God. She's sitting there playing with the pinchers boards. And so the angel kind of shows up, and she's thinking in her mind, like, I don't, I don't have a pinchers board that says anything about the Son of God. That's not where I'm at. I'm looking at my wedding. This is where I'm going. This is kind of what I'm doing. So the angel appears, and it's kind of inconvenient. Because she's planning to be married to Joseph. She's planning a life outside of this. So when the angel shows up, it really kind of messes up in her mind, her future. Because she's got it planned out. She's got what she's going to do. But here's the interesting thing. is things that we may call interruptions by God, God calls invitations. 
So when we have an interruption from God, he's saying like, hey, this isn't an interruption. This is me inviting you. This is me showing you something. So this invitation, kind of think back through the Bible. When you think about all these interruptions or invitations, think about different stories that you know of. Maybe Moses in the burning bush. Okay, Moses has God comes down, turns his, uh, this bush on fire and tells him he's going to do all these miraculous things in Moses's mind. That's an interruption. He wasn't planning on being faced with this burning bush or what's going on. But God's trying to tell Moses, hey, this is what I need you to do. These are the plans I have. Think about Jonah. Okay, God told Jonah, hey, I want you to go and talk to these people and do this. Jonah said, I ain't doing that. I don't like to stand in front of people. I get nervous. So I'm going to go for a swim in the ocean. I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to do all these things. So God says, all right, you're going to be interrupted. So I'm going to let this giant whale just eat you. Okay, so the whale eats him. That was his invitation from God. Like, okay, I'm going to make you sit in here until you're ready to accept the invitation I have for you. Or look at the look at the story of Saul. Before Saul became Paul, he was crucifying Christians and killing them. Uh, God stopped Saul in the middle of the road with a bright light blinding him. He was on his way to continue crucifying Christians. And God interrupts his life with an invitation. Why do you persecute me? That's what he ended up telling him. And that's when Saul becomes Paul. And then when he accepts that invitation, becomes one of the most God-loving, God-fearing people that we read about in the Bible. So these times, when we think in our lives, that's that's an interruption from God. Really, it's an invitation But it's an invitation to something better. God's got something better planned for our lives. But I think a lot of times in our lives, we kind of shake off those interruptions or invitations that we have from God. We shake those off and think, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not that's not for me. That's not where I want to go. But God has something planned for us. We may not see it right then. We may not see it right there. But God has something better planned for our lives. Some of you have kind of know my story. Uh, back in uh, when I was in college, I had was in for a recreation management degree, and to be able to finish school, I had to have a minor. I didn't know why. I didn't know why I had to have these things. The easiest thing I had down my path was youth ministry, just a small minor in youth ministry. I'm like, okay, first and foremost, I ain't never going to use that. I'm never going to stand in front of students. I'm never going to teach students. I'm never going to preach to students. I'm not going to do that. You have to think that was almost like over 10 years ago that I had that class, and then this is where I'm standing today is that God had a plan. God had that interruption like, hey, you're not going to be able to graduate unless you take these classes. At the time, I had no idea why. And then it ends up leading us to here because I was able to take it. I didn't realize at the time I was taking in an invitation. I just said, okay, I'm going to do this. I want to get done. I'm tired of college. I want to get out and have a real job. That guy was God's invitation to say, hey, one day you're going to do student ministry. One day you're going to use this to do something else. And to me, that's always kind of stuck because that was the way God was interrupting my life. And when God interrupts our life, somewhere along the way, it may not be right away. It may not even be uh, in the first couple years that you see it. When God interrupts your life, it's because he's trying to introduce you to something better. So when we go, let's go back to the story. We're going to drop down to, uh, to verse 30. So we're going to look at where the angel appears to Mary again and what he tells her about what he has better for. And what I'm going to do, I want to show you guys two different versions uh, of verse 30. The first one I'm going to show you is a King James version. And what it says is, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, that's where our series title comes from, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast favored with God. But what's really neat, if you look at the, the version that we use a lot uh, during the, tonight's message, is that we look at the New Living Translation. It says, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. So it's kind of neat. In both verses, you see the angel say, hey, don't be afraid. Fear not. Don't be scared. The point of that phrase is, is the angel telling Mary, hey, I've got something planned for you. Don't be scared. Don't let it bother you. Don't 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 run away from it. Don't be afraid of it. I've got a great plan for you. Now, for me, if that's me and the angel saying, hey, Adam, uh, God has favor with you. I'll do whatever he tells me to. If if God's like handing out his favor, I'm game. If God's sitting there saying, like, hey, Adam, you're going to have to carry the son of God. You'll be the first man that's ever been pregnant. Let's do it. Let's go. If that's what it takes to have the favor of God, I'm game. All right. So that's what God is saying. He's like, I'm like, count me in if you're having the favor. And that's what the angel is trying to tell Mary. Like, hey, God has favor in you. God wants to use you. And he's like, I'm here right now to tell you this. So we look at that. Why are we afraid of God's plans so much? Because one, we look at his his interruptions. 
uh, as inconvenient. But the second answer to that question that I have for you of why are we afraid of his plans is God's purpose is often different than yours. God's purpose is often different than yours. So his purpose is sometimes to use you differently than you've planned. You may have something in your mind. You may think right now, okay, this is where I'm going to school when I get done. When I'm done with high school, I'm going to college here. This is the career I'm chasing. In your mind, you may have felt like, okay, God's kind of told me, I kind of felt like God's saying I should do ministry or God's telling me I should be a missionary or God's telling me I should go into this line of work or go to this school. You know, God's telling you that because God's saying, look, your plans may not match up with mine, but I promise you mine are better. If you follow my plans and you're not scared of them, they're going to end up better in the long run. So as we kind of go back to that part where the angel's talking about Mary, we're going to drop down to verse 31. It says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus. He will be very great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So right then and there, Mary, go back into being in her shoes, sit in her seat. Mary's reaction is probably like, wait, what? Excuse me? And you're, I'm, 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 giving, I'm giving birth to who? You're telling me that I'm giving birth to the son of God, the son of God that's out there. The son of like his, his son, the son of the almighty, the son that we worship. That's who I'm. Ch- no, that she's probably like, no, that's not me. There's no way I'm giving birth to the son of God. You're crazy. I'm just imagining this. All this stuff, all these weird thoughts are probably going through her head right now because it's extremely heavy. A teenage girl is just told, hey, you're about to be a virgin mother and you're about to give birth to the Son of God. And on top of that, she's probably got some scared reaction to it because in her time, her day and age, if, there's a, if a woman is pregnant outside of marriage, then it's considered a sin and it's punishable by death. And you know all these people that she's talking about, hey, guess what, I'm pregnant. Like, wait, you're not married. Wait, y'all, she in her mind like, no, it's, I, I promise you, I'm still a virgin. You know, God, an angel came down. You know, they magically put a, you know, they put a, a baby in my belly. It's just kind of why people are going to look at her like she's nuts. Like, no, that didn't happen. That's not, no, there's no way. So you got to think in her mind, she's probably extremely scared. She's scared to death. And then what's funny is nobody ever thinks about Joseph. Think about him. Think about when she tells him like, hey, uh, honey, uh, hey, boo-boo, uh, Hey, bae, hey, sweetheart, I need to, I need to let you know I'm pregnant. Uh, excuse me? Because, uh, no, because you and, no, you and I, and, no, uh, there's no way. No, I, I am pregnant. Like, no, you're not. I know, I would have been there. No. Like, he's saying, like, you're not pregnant. Like, Joseph probably would have started freaking out. And she's like, no, you got to understand. The angel came and told me, I'm going to be a virgin mother. I'm going to give birth to the Son of God. In his mind, he's like, how is this possible? How in the world are you pregnant with the Son of God? This makes no sense whatsoever. So this is all going through through Joseph's mind. You got to think for both of them, they had their own plans. They had plans to be a family. They had plans to get married. And right now, the purpose that they thought they had is completely different from the purpose that God had for him. So when God interrupts you, with an invitation to something else, what you're going to discover, just like Joseph and Mary discovered, is that there's different plans than what we had. But they're not just different. They're going to be better. Can you imagine if Mary had kind of told the angel, like, nope, I'm good. You can, I mean, there's a girl down the street. I think Sarah, she's a whole lot better. Uh, I heard she's, she's probably going to be a great mother. She's a lot older than I am. If she just told the angel flat out, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, that's not who I am. You can do it. You can tell me whatever. I'm not going to be the the mother of the Son of God. Can you imagine what they would have missed out on? That, then to them, what they felt like was, uh, was this interruption, this huge invitation. They wouldn't have been known. They wouldn't have been, uh, they wouldn't have been known throughout history as the, the virgin mother of the Son of God, the one and only, the one that hung on the cross for our sins, that died for us. They would have been gone from that entire thing if they had said, no, I'm good. I don't want to be a part of that. That's not, that's not for me. That they had passed up and said, that's, that's heavy. That's too much. That's, there's no way I can be a part of that for God's plans. If they had just escaped from all that. But see, with God's plans, God has plans to bless us. God has plans to prosper us. God has plans not to harm us. And he has plans to give us this amazing and beautiful future that we have. God has our lives planned out. So when you look at that, 
do you view or have you had times in your life that you felt like God was pulling you in one way or another and you know in your mind, did you view it as an interruption or did you view it as an invitation? Which way did you look at it? So let's go back to the story real quick, kind of look at how Mary responds to the angel. So the angel just said, hey, Mary, guess what? <laughs> you're about to be the son of, you're about to be the mother of the son of God. You're going to be a virgin mother. Get ready. It's going to be a wild ride. Okay, so this is how she ends up responding to the angel. Verse 34, simple. All she says is, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. So that's right then and there. She's thinking like, Listen, Gabriel, it's nice to meet you, but it's physically impossible for me to give birth. Like, that can't happen. There's no way that I could give birth to the Son of God when I haven't done anything. How can I be a virgin mother? That phrase in itself makes no sense. So a lot of times we may be faced with things that we physically cannot do. And the best way that I thought that I could explain this to you guys is to kind of show you how many of y'all seen the movie Santa Claus? Tim Allen, old school. Think about the time he tried to go down the chimney. He's telling his son, hey, I can't fit down this chimney. And he's like, yes, you can. Just put the suit on. I can't fit down this chimney. And the son keeps telling him, just put the suit on and see what happens. So check this out real quick and watch this clip. No. You gotta put the suit on first. You know what we're gonna do is we're gonna get out of here because this whole thing is stupid. How come everything I wanna do is stupid? I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Freezing my nubs off out here. You want me to get the Santa costume, which is great. Santa costume. This thing, you never know where it's been. Ooh. Thousand malls. Well, I hope you're happy, Comet. Hope you're happy. But most of all, I hope the guy that lives here is a tailor. Nice coat. Well, how do I look? Nice? You've got the sash. You're right. This completes the ensemble. All right. Got my boots. Now I've got the suit on. How am I supposed to know what to leave? Maybe there's a list. A list? How silly of me. Of course there's a list. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Whoa, it's okay, I'm used to it. I lived through the 60s. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. All right, so that scene, the whole point I've showed you, because it's physically impossible for him to go down this chimney. Now, we know, it's a, we know it's a movie and all this movie magic, but it still happens, okay? He still ends up fitting down the chimney, one that's extremely small, just like with Mary. She's in her mind like, Gabriel, dude, there's no way this is going to happen. So what God is trying, or what Gabriel's trying to tell her is like, look, you got to have faith. Look, just listen to me. One day, I'm gonna, it's going to change your life. If right now, you just have faith, if you believe in what I'm saying, I promise you, your life's going to be changed for the better. Your life's going to be so much different than you ever thought. Now, with each of you, I'm sure you've kind of come against things that you've thought in your life. There's no way I can do that. There's no way that I can go here or I can, uh, I can give that speech or I can be a part of this uh, this event, this or that, there's no way that I can do it. In your mind, you're thinking like, it is completely and utterly impossible for me to do that. And that's where Mary's sitting at. So let's look at real quick how she responds, uh, how she ends up responding when the angel does. Here's what it says in verse 35. Excuse me, when the angel replies to Mary, it says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the most power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. So, right now, I know some of you in this room, there's whatever it is, there's an obstacle that you're facing. There's something right now that you're dealing with. It doesn't matter if it's personal, 
if it's with other friends, if it's with family, if it's with school. I know each of you right now in this room have something that you're dealing with, something that's an obstacle for you. And you in your mind probably think there's no way, it's impossible that I could ever get out of this. It's impossible that I could ever fix this. It's not, it's not going to happen. But what's really neat about our God is what's impossible with man isn't impossible with God. We may think in our minds it is. We may believe that it's impossible to go down this road, but God says, look, it's not. Did you know with one spoken word, God can intervene into any situation? God can change the outcome of whatever it is that you guys are dealing with, with one simple word. Think about Mary. She says, no way, not going to happen. There's no way that I can give birth to a virgin baby. You look at the angel and he says, the angel looks at her and says, write to her, for nothing's impossible with God. And that's how the angel responds. And I don't know where in your life you're going to be faced with this. I don't know what obstacles you may be dealing with right now. I don't even know down the road what's going to be presented to you by God. But what I do know is it's going to happen. And you're going to have those chances where you're going to be faced with something. You're going to have a time in your life where God's presenting something to you. And you don't, you don't know how to look at it. But just remember, when that's there, don't view it as an interruption. Don't view it as, hey, my life's not ready for this. View it as an invitation. So where in your life, think right now, where do you feel like, what do you feel like God's asking you to do? Because our God is involved in our life. Our God wants us to be, uh, he wants to direct us. He wants to shape us. He wants to lead us. He wants to mold us. That's what our God is. And I know right now, some of you probably know exactly where God's pulling you to. And I know right now, some of you are sitting here that may know where God's pulling you to. You thought the whole time it's an interruption. God, my life is not ready for this. This is not where I plan to be. This is not what I want to do. God, that's not me. I don't even know why you're calling me to do that. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from everything tonight, if you kind of look at when we're dealing with, with fearing God's plans, is that outcome is God's responsibility, but obedience is ours. Outcome is God's responsibility, but obedience is ours. So do exactly what that teenage girl did over 2,000 years ago. I know right now you may think that you've got it rough, you've got a lot going on, and you probably do. I know you guys have extremely busy lives, but think about Mary. She lives in a day and age where she could easily be, be killed for, for having a baby that she claims that that's a, she's a virgin still. She could be put into that. Do exactly what she did and give in and submit to life. See, she looked at her life. She had a chance. She could have said, hey, God, I'm about to get married to the man of my dreams. I got my Pinterest board ready to go. I got all these plans that I want to do, and you're interrupting me. It's not where I'm at right now. It's not what I'm ready for, but she didn't look at it as an interruption. She looked at what God was calling, what Gabriel was telling her as an invitation. It took everything she had, all her faith, to give in to him, and here's how she responds. Verse 38, last one, it says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true see in that small conversation we weren't there we don't know exactly how it went but the way I envision it is it took her probably about 30 seconds to realize that I have a chance to give in to something that you have planned I have a chance not to run and hide from a plan that you have and not only was she changing the course of her life but what she did over 2,000 years ago has changed the course of ours just because she said, you know what? I'll take this interruption and change it into an invitation. I'm going to have you guys go ahead and bow your heads for me tonight. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I, I want y'all just to kind of think back. Think right now. I know some of you, when we start talking about plans and being afraid, I know if there's probably something that's popped in your head. Doesn't matter if it's something as small as, as talking to somebody or leading a group or something as massive as God's calling you to do ministry, 
God calling you to do mission work, what, whatever it is, I want you to think back to it. Think about where you are right now and think about how you've kind of treated it. Think about what if you decided not to let it be an interruption, but let it be an invitation. Not only your life, but what about the lives around you? Who are you going to affect? Who are you going to change? And just like Mary, all you guys got to do is just have faith. And you just got to believe. Believe in God's plans because I promise you, whatever it is, is 10 times better than whatever we had planned out for our lives. God, we love you. I thank you for these students that they gave up their night. They came out. It's raining, God. They had every reason to stay home. But they came here to to hear your word, look at your story that we have, God, and look at it from a completely different perspective. And God, I just ask that you just tonight and lay your hand on these students. I know that you've presented plans for their lives. I know that you've presented presented ways that you're going to change their lives, that you're going to work in their lives. And I'm sure your plan is not the easiest one at times, God. I know it's just the way it is. Sometimes it is scary. It is fearful. Your plans are scary at times. But God, I ask that you just lay your hands on these students, show them that, hey, I'm going to walk through you every single step of this plan. And I promise you, just trust me, give in to me and everything I have planned is going to be amazing. God, we continue to thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice of your son that you gave to us, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen.